Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. <laughs> Ain't a fucking. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. Are we going to straighten out? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Next! Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! Welcome to Curveball Monday here at the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Phil here, and the reason I'm calling it Curveball Monday is because we have another interview, but it's quite a different interview than what we've done here in the past. Um, As everyone who's listening to this is well aware of, this show is primarily dedicated to drum set players. Um, Our vast majority of our listening audience is indeed drum set players and so our topics are generally geared toward that and all of our interviews to this point have been other drum set artists or uh, people who are in the music industry that have a distinct slant toward products or things that are of interest to drum set players well today we are going to do part one of a two-part series with a straight-up classical percussionist. It's the first one that we've had, but this is not any old ordinary classical percussionist. This is a legendary classical percussionist, and I'm going to introduce you folks this week to the longtime principal percussionist with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and the longtime coordinator, actually the originator of the percussion department at Georgia State University, Mr. Jack Bell. Now, a lot of you folks are not familiar with him, but the people who are familiar with him realize that my statement of calling him a legend is not, that's not a euphemism. He is an absolute percussion legend. Um, I like to say that Jack Bell is a victim of geography. Uh, And what I mean by that is this guy, he has every bit the clout, every bit of the performance pedigree and the educational pedigree of some of his contemporaries. Some of his contemporaries are these legendary names like Eldon Buster Bailey and uh, Anthony Cerrone. You can just continue to list these names. But Jack was essentially a kid when he joined the Atlanta Symphony back in the late 60s. And at that time, the Atlanta Symphony didn't quite have the clout of of some of these other orchestras like New York Philharmonic and Philadelphia Symphony and Boston and Chicago. And we actually addressed that in this part one of the interview. And so he'll go into uh, his reasons for, for why he is kind of what he is and where his status is, where it is. He's a very humble guy. He really really is. But I stand by my assertion that he has the educational and performance pedigree of some of the greatest classical percussionists found in some of the greatest and most highly revered orchestras in the world. Um, So in this part one, we are primarily going to talk about his education, where he studied with legendary percussionist Harold Firestone before uh, going to Oberlin College, where he did spend a good amount of time studying with the famous timpanist Cloyd Duff. Um, then we talk about his chance meeting uh, with Robert Shaw and his, uh, we'll call it his audition. It's a great story that he tells with Robert Shaw and his eventual move down to Atlanta and then his story career with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Lots of great stories here. Sometimes we think that drum set uh, musicians and, and other artists and bands have the market cornered when it comes to great and funny stories. Well, we're here to show you today that the symphony musicians have their share of good ones as well. So we'll see you on the other side. Here is part one with percussionist Jack Bell.
John, you know, when we do these shows, now we're a year into this. You know, we've done all kinds of shows. We've done topic-based shows. We've done interviews. And the running theme to virtually all of them is we sit down and we go, well, if we talk to this person or if we talk about this topic, can we make a full show out of it? You know, do we have enough material to do a full show? I don't think we're going to have that problem today. It appears that he is far more prepared than we are. <laughs> <laughs> but that is always better than the opposite. Well, I, I was I was telling some folks when we were going to inter that we were going to interview this gentleman. I said the challenge we're going to have is keeping this thing under four hours, mm -hmm. and that's just on one part of his career, not all of it. But but uh, yeah, I, I I met with with our esteemed guest just prior to this, and uh, we laid out a little bit of groundwork on what we were going to cover. But uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce to our listening audience who by the way, are primarily drum set players. So this is also a little bit of a departure uh, with our normal format. One of the foremost percussionists and percussion teachers ever. 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 Now, there's no caveats on this. You got to put it, you got to say how it is. Yeah, he's an absolute legend. And I would like to introduce the... 30 plus year principal percussionist of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and 30 plus year coordinator of the percussion department at Georgia State, Mr. Jack Bell. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Now, I've got to turn this around on you just a little bit, Phil and John. Do it. You <laughs> have created for me the most intense three weeks of my <laughs> life since I retired and you invited me to be on this program because you had me create and recreate the last 63 years of my life within a short three-week period. Can you imagine what I've been through to get ready for this program? Jack, when the book comes out, we only want a small percentage of the revenues. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, because of that, and because of something that I heard on NPR recently, and because of the stack, the three inch stack of materials that I ended up sending uh, you, Phil. I think it was more like four inch stack, Thank you. Jack. Uh, <laughs> I'll need some of it back then. <laughs> For this interview, uh, I decided to write my memoirs. And I want to give credit to Phil. I'll give credit to him in the book. This was the impetus for being able to write the material for my, uh, for my memoirs. Maybe one of the next steps in my life. Now, I'll only say one other thing to you, and you need to react to this. This is the okay. Johnny Carson Show for all just right, a second. All right. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a little bit nervous to be here, and you need to ask me why. Jack, why are you nervous being here? I, I'm glad you asked that. Phil. Oh, well, my pleasure. When I played in the Atlanta Symphony for a number of years, I didn't know what to expect. When I taught at Georgia State, for those many years, I did know what to expect. For this particular interview with you, I do not know what to expect. <laughs> and that makes me a little bit nervous. John, there do, you, you are. do you think you should be nervous? <laughs> not in the least. <laughs> not in the least. There's a couple <laughs> simpletons that are going to ask, like, you know, what size sticks do you use, Jack? And, you know, it's going to be a piece of cake. Yeah. No, Jack, it's, let me tell you, believe me, the, the honor is all ours. And uh, when I received that. It, That's in, not true. It's mine as much as it is yours. You have to believe that. That's the way my life has been. And it, it's the way it is now. Th this incredible stack of materials, which, by the way, I did bring along. It, it's, it's over here. I wanted to show John this. Uh, it, it absolutely, it put me on my, I had to get on my toes, man. I had to get on there to, to start. I mean, th the whole thing really falls back to what I first said. We could dedicate a week to, to Jack. We could do an entire week's worth of every day. We could do a podcast on one specific aspect. Uh, I know. I was, when you told it's me amazing. this, I was like, this amazing life. And, and you have their documented in front of you. Yeah. And it, that's, that's something that's really intriguing well jack let's let's go ahead and just dig right in on this and the the first thing i want you to do is give our listeners a little bit of of early childhood background as far as like 
when you were born, where you were born, and also your impetus and interest in studying percussion. When, when did it happen, and why did it happen? All right. I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. We have to stop. Uh, we don't, do we, we know have, anyone from Knoxville? We have to stop right now because <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know That's this. That's amazing. Jack, I was born in Athens, Tennessee, 50 miles south of Knoxville and got my undergraduate degree at Tennessee, University of Tennessee. So I'm already. So, thank you and good night, everybody. Well, good. <laughs> you did a great job, Jack. Yeah, thank you. I, it was a no. pleasure being here. My father got his degree and my mother also got their degrees from the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville, right? Yeah, Knoxville. right. I'm not going to stop you anymore, but it just unbelievable coincidence. But go right ahead now. I played at the World's Fair there. When? 1982. Oh, congratulations. That's all I got. Good. Well, that's a good contribution to the yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sorry, Jack. Go right ahead. I was uh, born in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1944, October 16th. Uh, that means that it was the time of the post-war. It was a very difficult time for my mother and father. My father was a chemist on the bench uh, at the Whitehall Pharmaceutical Company, and my mother was a housewife. We lived there for five years, and in those very early years, I don't remember much more than a toy scooter falling over at this moment, so I'll go ahead to my move to Elkhart, Indiana. Mm -hmm. When we arrived in Elkhart, Indiana, I had actually arrived in a small city of about 40,000 people. But amazingly enough, it was known as the music capital of the world. You can believe that, and you can look it up online, and you'll actually find that. That's because the major music companies of the world were located in Elkhart. I had no idea, of course. My father was transferred there with the Whitehall Pharmaceutical Company. But Kahn, Selmer, Bundy, Artley, and many others were located as their main headquarters for the band industry capital of the world. That's the more proper name for it. So I was about to become immersed in that total atmosphere, and little did I know. There was a fantastic municipal band made up of many of the members from these major music companies and local musicians in the area, I'm sure. I don't know the total makeup on it, but I do know in future years they were fantastic musicians. So I first was introduced to music being in fifth grade that I remember and standing not where the audience would generally stand or being seated out in front of the bandstand but i would go around in back of the bandstand like i guess a kid would and i was so enamored watching the percussionist perform uh, especially a snare drummer named betty langley now betty langley was an integral part of what happened in my future because I want to relate back to something here that I think you'll find very, very interesting. I'm going to say that my life's career actually began in December of 1944. Now, of course, that's my birth year. And I'm going to say that it began with the victim, I'm sorry, with the victory of freedom over tyranny. I know that's a very unusual introduction. But here's what actually happened. My first teacher, Harold Firestone, was in the 84th Division of the field artillery at that time. And during the Battle of the Bulge, he was hit with shrapnel. Now he happened to have a small record around his neck that was encased in a wooden box. And when he was hit by the shrapnel, the wooden box and the record were shattered, but it saved his life. That record was given to him by one of his students named Betty Langley. Mm. So I think in December of that year that my career began and his life was saved. I just think that's a re one of the remarkable coincidences that took, a, took place throughout my entire career now that I've been thinking back. Because she was the very lady that I stood behind in fifth grade and she was the very lady that I stood beside in 10th grade as becoming the youngest member of the Elkhart Municipal Band, playing beside her and with her fantastic technique, with the music flying by me and trying to keep up with her in that rudimental swing, 
concert band style that she played keep going oh well jack what i was going to say next that's the perfect introduction into your initial studies with mr firestone mm -hmm. now when you were in elkhart was he just known in the area that if you're going to study percussion this is the guy you're going to go to or how did you discover him okay when i started i want to make one small statement sure I'm trying to remember right now if it was betty langle or betty langley and i don't want to say her name wrong i i can't find it on my reference notes oh, that's okay so I'll, I'll have to be very careful that i want her name to be proper and I, it's one of those two names i just for the record yeah for the sure. record um my very first lesson started as all kids would probably when they're in middle school uh, or grade school. And I think what's remarkable about that is that we're talking 63 years ago. Mm -hmm. This Thursday night, I'm going to go audition sixth graders at a, at a, a elementary school trying to decide if they want to take percussion in their band program. Nothing has changed for 63 years. Right. The program, the band programs, it's all still exactly the same. That's just amazing that that's been able to survive like it has, unchanged for 63 years. So I was pulled out of sixth grade or allowed to go, and about six of us were there, and we went over to another room with the middle school band director playing on tabletops with our sticks and reading from the Yoder Elementary Method for snare drum. I did very well in that class. I found that it was very natural for me and I caught on quickly. Probably the only study in my life that I did that well at. J Jack, at that time, did you already know how to read? read no, music? everything was okay. brand new. It's being introduced to okay, me for gotcha. the very first time. Uh -huh. That was the very beginning of everything. Uh -huh. I don't know that I was holding the sticks properly, most likely not. And I don't know that I was playing anything that was introduced to me properly, probably, most likely not. But I was started. It was recommended by the band director <clears throat> that I was doing so well in the course that, uh, of study with him that I should uh, find a private teacher. Well, Harold Firestone, and I'm going to say it right now, is a name that I should believe for my life is a person that should be inducted into the Percussive Arts Society Hall of Fame because of what he accomplished, but mm -hmm. he's one of those unknown teachers, in essence, that time and history has bypassed, and I'm trying to make sure that he is recognized and noticed on my website, BelodiousMerchant.com. I've spent enormous amounts of time trying to dedicate it to him as well. I'll go ahead. I was recommended to him as a private teacher he was and has always remained one of the most profound teachers that you would ever find in your life because he was a graduate of Purdue University and he had a degree in engineering. He was a concert pianist and he was actually a baseball player. He broke his little finger playing baseball and so he wasn't able to pursue his career as a concert pianist or a baseball player. His eyesight was too poor for him to become a professional pilot. So he actually became a percussion instructor <laughs> after the war, you'd sort of say his fourth choice, but he became one of the best percussion instructors that ever existed. Because in the 1950s, as a 10 year old, as a nine year old student, on July 22, 1954, being student number 290 of the 550 students that he taught, I would go into a studio filled with a dozen plus percussion instruments, marimbas, many of them, vibraphones, xylophones, orchestra bells, chimes, drum set, timpani, piano, an organ that he had in there, a little pipe type organ, multiple percussion accessory instruments, mallets, everything lined up in the studio in perfect order. He had spotlights all around the studio. He had headsets for you to put on and microphones everywhere for you to record your name, the selection that you were playing, uh, the time that it was being recorded. When you would perform, he would record those lessons or videotape 
those lessons with 16 millimeter film I don't know exactly how the videotape he would take pictures of you with Polaroid camera and then in his late evening spare hours after he had taught 80 hours a week combining lessons with various students into groups he would sit and he would take those recorded lessons and he would put them into 33 and a third RPM records he would label the records and give them out to his students <laughs> I'm having to recover from getting emotional now mm -hmm. thinking about that because it's so overwhelming to me that he had that kind of love for his students and he dedicated his entire life to do that and I just hope you can appreciate the depth of that from a teacher that was so profound I'll recover here in a minute I'm sorry well Jack I think I think that in itself that story that you told absolutely relates to how your students think about you as well that's where you got your impetus and your profound knowledge and love of teaching it absolutely comes from mentors like Mr. Firestone and Mr. Duff uh -huh. of course right I actually go ahead John I kind of get the impression that had he gone with the three previous choices he might have been the best at that too he just sounds like an individual that I, I'm sure he would have been. has just total focus and dedication that's amazing he was so classically dynamic so classically a total type a personality which I couldn't identify at the time mm -hmm. I just I was so amazed by him I have to give credit to my parents who lugged in a, a seven and a half inch I think it is real tape recorder they were heavy that wow time. yeah and they recorded all of my lessons and I all I did was say mm hmm yes <laughs> nod my head I didn't understand yeah. hardly a thing he was saying I just didn't take it in as a as a nine-year-old student ten-year-old eleven-year-old and so I'd go home and I'd lay on the floor with the tape recorder on the floor and I'd listen and replay over and over those lessons that he did for me which I would recommend for every parent to do with their children at their lessons which they do not do today and be able to have the students replay all of those lessons so that they're really learning I'm gonna jump right now to my college students I could say to my college students exactly what I wanted them to learn and then I could turn to that college student and I could say now repeat what I just said to you and of course they couldn't do it so that's the way the learning process has to take place you have to have that endless repetition to be able to get the first time the facts are presented to you repeated so you know they've really understood it that's what I had to do with that small that, that, that large tape recorder uh, to really learn like I was supposed to and without that my learning process would have been probably non-existent Jack, I want to talk a little bit about his actual teaching style. Now, it's beyond known that this guy was he was an, a master of organization and a master of being able to present material. Um, when you would come to him, what was his overall general demeanor like? Was was he like this this gentle guidance kind of uh, of mentor teacher or was he did he have a little bit more of a heavy hand? I was in Elkhart, Indiana. When I went to Elkhart, Indiana with my first motorhome to have it customized, I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning in order to be at the workstations at six o'clock in the morning because they were at work hard at six o'clock in the morning. And when I would ask them a question, they would answer the question in one or two short sentences and they had nothing else to say to me. Now, I'm from the South, basically, because I've lived here for 32 years. We sometimes have long, drawn-out conversations about how we're going to do something. Up there, I was with Firestone. I was in also the trailer capital of the world, if mm -hmm. you can believe that or not. Mm -hmm. So Firestone was a northerner, and he had a very dynamic, short, sharp personality. I'm sure he was as loving as it could be, but I was only 9 or 10 years old. I couldn't understand the short, quick, judgmental almost, if I say it in that, I didn't know what that word would have meant then, but personality that was guiding my lessons. For instance, 
There's a famous reading book called Podemsky's Method for Snare Drum. Mm -hmm. Most percussionists know that or probably should. When I was playing my snare drum reading exercises out of Podemsky, he would have a pencil in his hand. And every measure that I would miss, his hand would fly up in front of me and do a quick mark on the measure that I missed each one degrading my confidence and my <laughs> ability to play 1% more with each mistake. And that would happen maybe 30 times, I'm not exaggerating, but it would happen some number of times going down the page in Podemsky so that I was just a, an amoeba on the floor, a 10-year-old 10, 10 amoeba on the floor by the time we finished that reading exercise. Well, it taught me to read. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was playing my rudimental snare drumming, Maybe I wasn't keeping perfect time. You know, I was not steady with the metronome. So all of a sudden, I would feel his shoulder, uh, I'd feel his uh, hand on my shoulder, and he'd have me stand stiff leg like a little robot. And then he would move me back and forth in time, walking back and forth with my stiff legs. Sometimes I'd be reading the music too. So he had me going back and forth like a metronome which means, of course, the music was flashing back and forth in front of my eyes, which I'm not sure he was that aware of, I'm sure he was, and I was trying to play. So that was embedding, in essence, steady time in me while I was learning to play the solos. One time, I was playing with rabbit ears, that's holding your first and second finger out away from the stick, where your first and finger, by his teaching, would be comfortably down with a traditional grip wrapped around the left stick and he would take the back end of the stick and he would slap it so that the stick would go flying out of your hand <laughs> which would be a kind of an endless source of embarrassment so one time he did it and the stick slapped up and knocked his glasses off of his face now I just cowered to the floor when I saw that but he stopped knocking the stick out of my left hand because I never opened my stick's left hand with a rabbit ear again. <laughs> those lessons took place. And I have to say, are you familiar at all with Nexus? Oh, the percussion ensemble, yeah, yes. with Bob Becker. Bob Becker. Fantastic mm -hmm. performing. One of the guys in Nexus was warming up with snare drum backstage at Symphony Hall. He happened to be playing with rabbit ears. So... <laughs> I was walking down backstage, a wonderful player. I saw it, I couldn't resist it, so I slapped his stick <laughs> when I was walking by, and his stick went flying through the air backstage. He looked very startled. I looked back at him over my shoulder, and fortunately he started laughing. <laughs> that was the end of that. Jack, that's tr tremendous, man, it really is. Uh, when you when you first went into Mr. Firestone's studio, did he have a particular order of instruments that he had, had you study with, or did he have you study on multiple instruments at, at one time? He had what would be called an individually competitive studio. He always had you working for rewards. He actually had your lessons planned out for months in advance wow. when you first came in. They were in his file folder, they were on sheets of paper, and they would advance you sheet to sheet to sheet. I never was able to replicate that. I wish I had his catalog of that kind of progress of those exercises. I did it with books. He had it all written out on those uh, mimographed papers, including the books. That was more phenomenal than I ever produced. So it was competitive. That was one way that you existed in the studio. He not only, if you listened on my, my, uh, my Melodious Merchant website, you will hear in there the prequel one and the prequel two. We actually was able to recreate and save from those old 33 and a third recordings 63 years ago, my performances, including the announcements and Firestone playing the accompaniments of the time that I was nine, I think they started at 10, 11, 12 years old, on up into middle school. So he emphasized in the studio, and I played mallets, mm -hmm. mallet instruments, at the same time 
that I was starting snare drum. I also played timpani. In fact, I was playing some timpani pieces, not just playing exercises like people do. He had the full orchestral recordings playing, blasting out through loudspeakers, and you would play timpani right in the excerpt playing the orchestral parts right along with the orchestra mm -hmm. just like you were playing a rosini i can't remember the one we played I, i've got to try and figure that out because I'll, I'll hear it announced mm -hmm. on the recording but i can't believe that i was playing that much timpani at that age it startled me when i heard my own legacy recordings being performed i can't <clears throat> believe that i was playing that much mallets at an early age i was startled by it when i finally heard these records being reproduced or that much snare drum. He also had you playing chimes. Uh, he had you give announcements for Merry Christmas to Mom and Dad where you would start out on marimba. You'd have three or four counts or maybe a measure. You would jump to orchestra bells. A measure, you would jump to chimes. And just like you'd be in a recording studio because the cameras were rolling, the video camera was running, you were recording into the microphone and you were jumping between instruments and you were only 10 years old. Can you imagine that? It, how did I become who I am? Right. I was already who I was becoming mm -hmm. then. Right. I just didn't realize it. You can't go to another studio in the country, probably, and replicate no. what's happening in the late 1950s, because I graduated high school in 1962. I need to tell the tragic story of Firestone's death in a word or two. Sure, sure. I, I guess I should. Well, let, let me ask you this, and, and we'll, we'll go in order with that really quick. It made me think when you were talking about the different instruments that you were studying with him, and then you already mentioned the Podemski book. What were a few of his methods that he liked to use? Obviously, Podemski for snare drum. What were some of the others? Uh, the NARD. Uh -huh. That book contained wonderful solos. I didn't even realize until I started doing this research that ba that book was still available. I actually, I think I realized before the research a little bit, I ordered the book and I, I recognized some of the old solos that I was playing because when I heard my prequel, I said, what is that solo? It sounds so good. That's not in any of the Haskell Harb book two, which I teach from and he used. Mm -hmm. uh, these solos are far better than that. Anyway, it came out to be the old NARD series. That, that's still available at, at Steve Weiss and right. other places. Uh, we did the Wilcoxon, and we did the entire Wilcoxon. The one, this is the 150? 150 uh -huh. solos. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Wilcoxon. Mm -hmm. And there's another story that comes into mind about that at Oberlin that I'd have to jump to if you wanted to hear it, but not. Anyway. Feel free. Go ahead and tell, because that's directly okay. related this to that. Is Go the, ahead. This is the barn and the horse, you know. And say <laughs> okay. the barn, I get resonance, and I hear the horse. Yeah. I see the horse. Uh -huh. uh, when I was at Oberlin, and I was in my first year because I was 18 years old I had just gotten there there was a contest being held in the state of Ohio in Cleveland and it was called the Drumarama I just realized that recently because my teacher was Jack Shirley a wonderful man I want that posted on the podcast he took over the Firestone studio after Firestone died in 1962 or 1960 I'm sorry 1960 I graduated high school in 1962 and went to Oberlin College Conservatory of Music in 1962. So I was a freshman at Oberlin in 1962 and the Drumarama contest came about sponsored by, um, I better not say because I can't remember right now. It's all right. But I went over there and Charles Wilcoxon was one of the judges for that. I was playing Jack Shirley's solo unprinted at that time, maybe unprinted now, called the Michigan Champion, because he was from Michigan. It was past all the Wilcoxon books. It was past the Wilcoxon swing solo book, which is pretty intricate. It was past the Pratt solo books. It's a hard solo. I don't know this recorded anywhere, but I have the music for it still. And I've performed it a number of times. Good chops. So I went over to Cleveland I was late. I told them I was going to be late because I had to drive over from Oberlin and I was the last contestant there. So all the other contestants had performed for the statewide competition. And when I arrived, all the contestants were still there with their drum cases open, waiting for this guy to finally show up so they could get the conclusion of the statewide contest. So I arrived, got my drum open, 
went up on stage to play my uh, Michigan champion solo. After about th three, I had it memorized, after about three or four measures or so of playing the solo, <laughs> all these contestants around the building started packing up their drums and <laughs> slamming their drum cases shut and leaving <laughs> the auditorium. <laughs> I, I couldn't react to it at the moment, but now that I think back, I have this image of them doing it. I see them doing it. I, I kind of laugh inside just a little bit. Just, I don't know, a tiny bit of ego in there, but I don't have a lot. But that was a moment. And so I finished playing the solo for Charlie Wilcoxon, and I did win the contest. And then Charlie Wilcoxon reared back in his seat, and he asked me if I would repeat the solo <laughs> for him. That was a great moment. So there's more details about that, but I think that's the most profound moment. Great. And, and also, I like that also, no pressure sitting there performing in front of yeah, Charles really. Wilcox. I, did, and, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> oh, really? Well, I didn't know yeah, at the time. Helped. I didn't yeah. know. I never, I was, I was just young and unoriented. Yeah. I just knew I was going over there to play a, a solo to try and win a competition. I didn't even know after I met him all of who he was sure i only did that in reflection as the years went by i mean i knew that i'd played the wilcoxon book right but i didn't realize historically at that time not at 18 years old mm -hmm. who charlie wilcoxon was and his Certainly. place in percussion yeah history so, jack jack let me ask you um you know many uh student this this period in time over and 18 years old it's a very you know important time for musicians and that they really kind of get an idea of what they want to do what what really did you have in mind as far as starting at the school what were you, what did you want to accomplish was it symphony playing or what were there what, what ultimately were you dreaming of of doing i was a young student out of elkhart high school I was playing with John Davis, John Davies. I wish I could write this down. Help me remember it after the podcast. I'm going to write it down for you. Who was a phenomenal band director, because I just remember this at the, this moment, and he was the first conductor of a high school band to be placed in the Ford Foundation's position. He, he Whatever they had going musically, he was the first conductor to be placed in that position right out of our band in Elkhart, Indiana. I'll have to investigate that more. Now, because he was such a phenomenal band director, we had a great band and a great orchestra. So I had that experience back in the 1950s to be able to play the Beethoven Seventh on timpani, to be able to play a Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony on timpani. Mm -hmm. I knew I really enjoyed that, but I only had two things on my mind through high school, drums and girls. Yes. That was it. Was I a typical drummer? Well, well, well we're clearly, clearly we're related. I was going to say, I don't know about Phil. Atypical, because you're supposed to have them reversed. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Actually, in high school, girls but, and drums. Now in college, uh, we might have thrown beer in there too. But. I didn't do that. I okay. never did. I never did do that. I was actually, I was actually forced, dragged down to have my first beer <laughs> at Overland. <laughs> I drank a lot of beer and some interim years between my marriages there, yeah. and that, that little yeah. interim time. But it just it never happened to come about too much. <laughs> Two beers would loop me. Yeah. And if I ever played symphony, and I did a couple of times after a beer or so. I was worthless and I could not do it. So, you know, it, it, yeah. the, the habits would dictate my life. Mm -hmm. no, so, no smoking, no beer, no alcohol, no drugs. That's, yeah. that's my life stand. Very yeah. good. Okay. Now, so, we got to go back. Right. I was graduating from high school with that awareness. My parents were willing for me to get a degree in music, but they were aware enough about music that they said the only way, and they, they didn't have funding to get me through Oberlin, only enough to get me started, basically. It was through the death of their parents that there happened to be, again, one of these coincidences that allow life to take place, enough money to come in to allow me to finish the first four years of Oberlin. I financed my fifth year, which could be talked about or not. But when I started Oberlin, I was totally unoriented. I was left on a street corner, not even knowing which way to go or who I was. I didn't know what I was doing with my music. 
I didn't know what my future would be. I only knew that my parents told me if I was going to go there, I had to major in music education. I had to become basically a band director mm -hmm. because they thought that would be the only career that would provide some sort of uh, solidarity in my life. And of course, to some degree, they were, they were right. But circumstances came about studying with Cloyd Duff, the timpanist with the Cleveland Orchestra, my lifelong mentor, my other teacher that changed my life, like Firestone did, that because of his influence, his connections, and his teaching, of course, I was able to study the orchestral excerpts in my fifth year at Oberlin, my master's degree work. I didn't finish the master's, but I did a lot of work towards it. I did a master's level recital, of course. And because of that, I was recommended to Robert Shaw by Cloyd Duff for the position of the new Atlanta Symphony, the big changeover for Robert Shaw taking over the Atlanta Symphony in 1967. And it was at that point, there's so much detail that I can tell about that, and there is one thing I want to tell, which is about my audition with Shaw. It's kind of remarkable. No audition will ever happen like that or ever happen again. But uh, because of that connection, auditions back in the 1960s were not the intense nationwide, worldwide, which is truth, auditions that take place behind a screen with seven or eight members of the orchestra auditioning applicants that come in to play for a half an hour or 15 minutes or whatever the time allocation is for their first round of auditions to be eliminated to go down through another series of auditions till they finally make it to the finals and finally one person from the world in essence would be selected for that spot in a major orchestra. Mine was through my senior recital or my graduate recital, recordings, recommendation letters, and more than anything, the word transfer of one great mind to another, like Cloyd Duff speaking to Robert Shaw. This is the student that I believe would fulfill that position in your quest for a new principal percussionist with the Atlanta Symphony. This 23-year-old kid that didn't really know what he was doing from my side that Duff was so favorable for of finding this new position of work like I did for my students for mm -hmm. years to come. Can I go to the audition that took place? Well, I, I'm just fascinated by that, that you know, you, you clearly spelled out what a typical audition for a major symphony would be. And your audition is more akin to our world, which is amazing. And we, I, I don't know if I've, I don't know if I've auditioned for anything other than all state band. It's a yeah. word of mouth recommendation, a respected person saying, this is a guy. And so it's, it's really fascinating to me that that was your, your audition was like that almost more in, in, rock and roll world in a way as opposed to that well don't confuse the auditions for something like all state band that might have taken place back then at a certain point because i've been involved with those in the high school and the middle schools you know right now currently mm -hmm. and they do have to go through a, a, a rigorous audition playing mallets mm -hmm. snare drum and timpani through an audition committee or a person to be able to make that uh honored position to be in one of the all state bands so it replicates a symphony audition. It really mm -hmm. does, truly, okay. at that level. There's one thing funny about the uh, auditions that take place for national. I sat on mm -hmm. a few of them, and, and you just have to see the back scenes of this because these are fantastic musicians, you know, world-class symphony musicians auditioning people that are sometimes world-class musicians coming in. Sometimes they have very high recommendations, a good DVD, and a good... Uh, a general presentation of their self that you give them the chance to be selected to be auditioning. But when they actually show up and play, it's just not what it should be. Right. It's just not at the level it should be. So let's say that we have seven people on the audition committee sitting behind the screen. And they're very patient and they're very sharp and they're very wonderful musicians. You have a bad musician come in and play and they play for about mm, a minute 
all these fantastic musicians have now resumed a comfortable position behind the screen. They're reading newspapers. <laughs> they're eating candy. They're not paying any attention to the auditionee anymore, in essence. Maybe there's more time given to them, of course. But I sat in that so many times where uh, the guy's dust at that time. Right. He's still playing his heart out for the rest of the audition, but they know. It's already You over. just know when you hear it that it's not going to work, that it's not national level quality performance. Mm -hmm. and so when you, when you hear that, you, you can't spend any more time just listening to it. Now, if the other kind of musician comes in, they really perk your attention to the point that everybody sits up in their chair. They're taking notes like mad. They're talking to each other. Once in a while, they're leaning and eh, get a little peek through the, mm -hmm. through the audition. They don't really do that anymore, but I mean, you know, it could happen. But, you know, there's the difference between the two when you're doing that national level audition. Sure. So let, let, me, let me ask one question. Um, you were recommended by your teacher to Mr. Shaw. Correct? Yes. Does, does that, in, in your years with the symphony, as far as that, were there a lot of that, those circumstances were some of the recommenders that just... No. That, I, was, I was, I was, well, so I don't different. know what happened in 1967 when Shaw first came in and the orchestra made the start of its major change mm -hmm. from being an, a, a, a good performing orchestra that grew out of the community orchestra that was conducted then by Harry Sopkin and then became Robert Shaw's orchestra. But the auditions that took place shortly after Shaw came in, I'm not sure the number of years, became the regional national types of strict auditions for any new player that came in because they were trying to grow the orchestra into a fully professional level mm -hmm. sure so jack i want to step back just a little bit because there's a couple of really important things that that we want to cover and we were in the middle of talking about a, a couple of the other methods that mr firestone used and mm -hmm. then i do want to go ahead and, and have you discuss his death about how mm -hmm. how That'd that happened very brief yeah um uh, but we know the, the, the snare drum methods that, that you had just mentioned. What were some of the keyboard and timpani methods that he had you use? I can only remember the books and the pieces and the covers to, mm -hmm. to a degree, because I don't think they're in print okay. anymore. Yeah. But they were beginning mallet method books. They actually had you playing with two and three mallets. I didn't go above three mallets at that time, although he had sheets that I remember that I still have, like Finlandia. He had arrangements that he made of classical pieces that had you playing four mallets. And I played a number of four mallet pieces with an interlocking grip. Right. I didn't have the independent grip of the Lee Howard Stevens grip or the Gary Burton grip or mm -hmm. various things like that. I didn't use the one, two, three, four, or four, three, two, one techniques. Right. He did, though, and that was the amazing thing. When I was playing with my three mallet or my four mallet pieces, he would be on the bottom end of the instrument improvising against all of my melodies moving around the instrument with independent motion in his hands like he was playing piano. And he would be improvising accompaniments to all of my pieces, which I can hear on the recordings now when I look back, but I wasn't even aware of it when I was recording at that young age because all I could do was barely get through the recording of those pieces. But right. now it was so phenomenal when I look back. Interesting, That that is that is amazing. So he, he had, was it actually like a Stevens grip he was using? I don't know. That? I don't right. know what his grip was. I can't. I can't remember it. I don't remember looking at it because any time he used it, I was always playing. Right. I never got. I never asked him to see it. I, I don't know. And then go ahead and tell our listeners um, about Mr. Firestone's passing. Yes. He was my fabulous one and only teacher from nine years old, which would be sixth grade until I was in 10th grade and my years might be not perfect approximately six years it took me through my middle school years where I advanced enormously we were in a contest that we were performing in December of 1960 and he didn't answer the door so I was the first one there I, I, I had to be 16 
because I had just gotten my license and I drove over in a Volkswagen that my parents owned alone. I got a big ladder from the barn in the back of his house, by the way, which he housed a homeless person back there and cared for him. No one knew that. And I climbed up the ladder and the window to the second floor was all frosted so I couldn't see in. Since he hadn't shown up, some way the uh, word got to his adopted sister, Aline Trafford, who had grown up in the Firestone family and was a very good percussionist, as her daughter was. And she opened the door, and I was, she was very worried. I, uh, I was coming in right behind her, and she ran up the stairs to the second floor. When she ran up the stairs to the second floor, she let out a loud cry of agony, and I was right behind her. And at that moment, Firestone had died of a heart attack, all twisted up in the coat hangers and wires that he had struggled with trying to get to the door. And he was on the floor with his eyes wide open, and he was looking directly at me. I panicked. I drove straight home. I ran all the stoplights going home. And when I got to my parents, I just yelled out, well, he's dead. And my parents grabbed each other in, in terrible tears. They tried to pull me into the circle, but I just stiffened up and reacted negatively. I was so mad that he had died on me. Now, I never understood all of that until my later years, until I tried to become Firestone for my entire teaching career. And that's who I've become. I became Firestone. I became Duff. And then eventually I gradually broke away and I also, after probably 20 years of teaching, I became myself, whoever I became to be, integrated into those other two personalities. So I'm really a composite personality of my teaching, at least, of three people. It's fascinating. I think our prior meeting, we, we discussed that. I think that that's exactly what all successful teachers are, is that you've had success with great teachers prior to that you learn from them you essentially in so many ways imitate them and then over a period of time through all of the things that we learn through other performances and through our own teaching practice you end up sort of being an amalgamation of your great teachers and yourself it's absolutely fascinating um so now on to oberlin we've already covered a little bit of that um when you studied with mr duff he's world renowned as arguably the greatest timpanist that's that's ever lived i know you spent a good amount of time working on timpani with him while you were there uh, did you of course continue and go through all the other methods and all the other instruments as well continue working on snare drum uh, mallets accessories that type of stuff how did mr duff's lessons compare and contrast to mr firestone's sort of a diametric opposition to Firestone in a sense. Interesting. Firestone mm -hmm. was so uh, class A, was it type A personality, mm -hmm. very, very, uh, uh, like I said, I've described Firestone's personality. Mr. Duff was known as the aristocratic country gentleman of the orchestra world. He had that very calm, laid back, relaxed personality when he taught, hand on your shoulder, quiet talking, relaxed, loving atmosphere, nothing being pushed. I played the 150th solo in the Wilcoxon book, the White Wilcoxon book, for my first lesson. And he said, well, that ends your rudimental career with me. And so we never went back and did any more rudimental drumming. So we had, you know, if you take your hand and you look at it, and you use your thumb and go through your index finger, you have rudimental, concert, rock, jazz, and Latin. Well, unfortunately, at Oberlin, they had banned anything having to do with music other than concert or orchestral music on campus. They wouldn't allow anything other than folk music. Mm -hmm. So no jazz or anything came in until I was in my fifth or fourth year there. And they had their very first jazz festival. Very unusual situation. I don't know why that was all happening, political or otherwise. But anyway, so we studied concert snare drum, two mallet mallets he never got into the four mallets i had that from james moore for my first introduction of the ripple technique mm -hmm. uh from uh, uh 
Ohio State University when Duff was in Russia and, and James Moore came over to teach for a full semester. He was a wonderful teacher. I learned I would never have my formal at introduction if it hadn't been for him. And then we did timpani and the accessory instruments. We didn't do the accessory instruments really until my fifth year there. So it was just basic snare drumming, concert snare drumming, basic reading from the Goldenberg uh, snare mallet, method or mallet, mallet. snare mm -hmm. book and mallet method mm -hmm. book, and then uh, the uh, uh, the timpani from the Saul Goodman book, uh, uh, starting with that that book. Um, now he came over once a week from Cleveland for the lessons, and he taught an hour lesson there. Sometimes he was so tired coming over there from the lessons, he would nod off <laughs> when I was playing my mallet excerpts. And that was a great relief because I didn't have all my Goldenberg excerpts down as well as I should. And I'd catch mm -hmm. out of the corner of my eye that he was nodding off, so I'd happily go ahead and play them and do pretty well on them, I guess. And yeah. It didn't happen all the time. But he was patient, and he would ask for me to review the exercises, and he would help make comments on it. And I'm sure he was a fantastic mallet player, and he was a good snare drummer. But, of course, timpani was his thing. So we would finally graduate each time over to the beginning timpani lessons. Now, I know he, can t he carried an internal frustration because of my ear, my lack of the ability to be able to catch a note at its center, like a fine string player. Because you understand, timpani is an instrument of sliding pitch, mm -hmm. like a violin player would play, like a trombone player would play. You have to find the center of the instrument with your ear and be able to move the pedals so that you can find the center of the note regardless of what's happening in the orchestra, even tuning a note to a new key while the orchestra's in a foreign key to what you're tuning. That requires the ear of a fine violinist. I did not have that kind of ear. I never did stories relate to that as to how my career survived getting through the sightseeing classes so anyway uh, those are for another interview yeah. <laughs> I was able to learn to play all the timpani techniques as well as probably any student that he ever had but I knew I didn't have the ear so when my audition came up of course I was to be the principal percussionist and the assistant timpanist with the Atlanta Symphony and I was supposed to take over from the current timpanist with the symphony. Now Duff had trained me the fifth year that I was there. I stayed the fifth year for multiple reasons. On the orchestral excerpts on, on uh, primarily mallets and orchestral snare drumming and some of the accessory instruments. Uh, but when the audition came up, I was simply playing a large orchestral choral number with Shaw conducting on Finney stage at the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. That, in essence, was my formal audition as it took place. Of course, I was just pins and needles to get that exactly right. I've never played harder in my life. But I had good Dresden drums, and I was playing on uh, you know, wonderful equipment that had tuning gauges all set perfectly, so I was able to compensate. That's why in my career, most honestly, after some very bad personal experiences, one being with James Levine, a conductor with the Metropolitan Opera, I think, uh, a fantastic musician, that I finally decided I could no longer be the assistant timpanist with the orchestra because of my ear. I didn't want to get caught in any more of those situations. I struggled too much. Uh, I played many, many church performances successfully that way. I had enough to do that, but no longer with the symphony. And that's when Bill Wilder, the second percussionist with the symphony, became the assistant timpanist. He had a fantastic ear, wonderful ear. He just didn't have the same kind of technique that Duff taught, which both Mark Jancic, who is the current timpanist with the orchestra, and Paul Jancic, who was the timpanist then, who is now the timpanist with the Cleveland Orchestra, right. we all played exactly the same style, which is the French grip, mm -hmm. thumbs up, and lifting, which is the Duff style, rather than hands over flat, playing down a little more into the drum, which is the German style. And, and of course, Bill lifts on the timpani, but he plays the German style more. So I didn't agree with Mark's style. But that's another story. It worked out very good. Jack, as a side note, while we're talking about timpani, really quick to tell everybody out there, when you do play timpani, do you do your setup in the German style? Yes, big yes. drum on the right. I right. always play German style. That's what I grew up being taught. French grip on a German style setup. Exactly. That's what it would be, great. One thing I want to add, 
that I think is incredibly important, and I don't want this to go overlooked, is that, Jack, you studied with Mr. Firestone and Mr. Duff back in the 50s and 60s. And some of the books that I just want to run by everybody again, the Podemsky snare drum method, the Goldenberg snare drum method, the Goldenberg mallet book, the Saul Goodman timpani book, the NARD rudimental book, every single one of those books are books that are used currently today. They are absolutely as valid and important today as they were back then. So I think it's important for all of our listeners to, because, because there was a podcast that was done several months back where we talked about these, these must-have type method books and some of those were mentioned in there. I think it's incredibly important for our listeners to realize that, that in so many ways they're almost like a rite of passage uh, for you know serious students. So when you talk about a specific method book and you're given an individual teacher who might have written his own method book, for instance, a high-level teacher. It's the book, but it's also a composite that becomes the teacher that's using the book. I use those books through my entire career because I grew up being taught by those books. And that means that I knew the books inside and out. I knew how to interpret them in total. It wasn't just the book. It was my ability to interpret the content of the book. Now, another teacher from another state like New York or uh, Philadelphia, they wouldn't have emphasized then at all the rudimental techniques. I went to Aspen with a couple of their players in the 60s, and they didn't have any rudimental background. They had good concert technique background. So that was a Midwest technique, the rudimental technique. It wasn't an East Coast technique more at that time. That's fa I didn't know that. That's fascinating. So uh, that particular orientation to teaching was done as a result of my, my specific background and those specific books. And I'll uh, uh, digress here for a second because you asked me a question just before the interview about do you think that I would have survived my career in the orchestra if I had started my career in New York or Philadelphia or San Francisco or some other major orchestra city? Well, oh, go ahead. actually, right. Jack, part of, part of that was, was maybe, maybe, yeah, along that line about surviving. But my take on it was would Jack Bell be a household percussive name if you were in the New York Philharmonic, Cleveland Symphony, Chicago Symphony, Philadelphia. That that was really where I was coming from. But go ahead and and, and go with, with what you were uh, initially saying there about surviving okay. in a different orchestra. Well, I'll answer the question two ways. If the name Jack Bell had been the name Buster Bailey, right, and I yeah. was in the New York Philharmonic, then I would be a household name known across the world. Now, I think... I have the snare drum technique of Buster Bailey. I'm sorry, I don't want that to be egotistical, and I don't want to stand up beside him and play right now, but I think we'd be very comfortable together because I've had 50 years of playing the snare drum, and I've done it at a professional level, and I, and I know what I can produce. But I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I grew up from a post-community orchestra that did not have the reputation of one of the top five or six or seven orchestras. So we were a next level down orchestra, a great orchestra, but not a superior, i find the right words, orchestra, like the top five or eight. Mm -hmm. Those are the orchestras where people developed immediate recognition across the world by being in that orchestra. Now, the second part of that is if I had gotten out of school being who I had become and I tried to go into Chicago or New York or Philadelphia, first names that come to mind, I would have been crushed because I did not have the ability to function in a professional working symphony, even though I'd had all the college experience. I couldn't handle the repertoire that would be coming past me in lightning experience. I couldn't play all the mallet parts in context of the music 
because you have to learn those and grow into those as a young player over a period of years. Not the young players today. They're more coming up in lower orchestras building up for the major symphonies. They have the experience. Back then, I was right out of college. So as an example, when we did the first major overture that Shaw conducted, we're doing the overture to De Meistersinger, Wagner. All I had to do was play a triangle part. And I got lost in the counting mm -hmm. of that. I was so overwhelmed by the sound of the orchestra. I was scared. It was just the whole thing. I just couldn't concentrate. And when my triangle part came up, it wasn't predominant, but Shaw knew it was there. And he looked at me and he was basically looking at this scared little kid standing there with a triangle in his hand, not knowing what he was doing. And the look on his face was so disappointed. I'll never forget that. Who have I hired? What have I done? What mistake have I made? That's my projecting what he was thinking. Sure. He's just looking. My principal percussionist just missed his first triangle entrance of his life. You know, I don't know what he was thinking. As the year went on, I played some very, very difficult mallet parts, and I, I regained myself to some degree. But as an example, when we were on tour, Shaw being as loving as he was towards me and the relationship being as good, he brought me into his curtained part-time uh, 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 dress room, and he said, you missed an entrance in that piece. And I tried to make an excuse about my, my sneers or something. And he said, don't let it happen again. I said, yes, sir. And I went out of the room. And that was the atmosphere that you were in. Now, we have delayed this gratification for a long time, but we now have to go back and hear about the actual <laughs> audition with Robert Shaw All right. coming through the recommendation of Mr. Duff. Right. Well, no audition will ever happen like this. It's a great short story. Not make my short, short story shorter now because I know we need the four hours if we're going to cover this. <laughs> We have to come back again. I think that's all there is to it. Um, taking my audition at Oberlin, my fifth year of Oberlin, Robert Shaw, the great, profound, worldwide known choral conductor of the Robert Shaw Chorale, was taking over the Atlanta Symphony. We we're in a very large dressing room in the basement of Finney Chapel, and his secretary was to bring me in. I can't think of the secretary's name right now. I had it right on the tip of my tongue because he always used to call her out by her first name and say, send in or do this or do that in his booming voice. So he said, send in Jack Bell. So they, she opened the door. And as I walked into the downstairs, huge arena just sounded, surrounded by benches and nothing else in the entire room, Robert Shaw was standing in the room absolutely butt naked. <laughs> and he was facing me. Now, the second I came in the room, because he was all the way across the basement there, he turned around, so all I could see was his rear end and his, his big profile. And he shouted out immediately as he was putting his jockey strap on, getting ready to go up and conduct this shoes event. He shouted out, Duff says you're a better Duff, are you? <laughs> there was this moment of silence and I said well I play pretty well that's all I could say <laughs> I don't remember what else happened I just don't I don't remember I can't fill in the moment after that I can't remember now and I couldn't remember then we went up we did the performance I was on my toes all the way to the performance I got the job so Aside from the meeting with Mr. Shaw, your actual audition was the performance then, was really what Plus, it was. Plus, my perpetual motion, Zergunerweisen, my snare drumming, my entire senior plus master's recital, mm -hmm. recommendation letters from Mr. Duff, all the people at the university that were very favorable towards me, um, a whole plethora of materials, a packet like I sent you mm -hmm. went in to Mr. Shaw. And you didn't laugh at him. I didn't laugh. I was... <laughs> that, that was probably a big plus. If I, <laughs> if I was the age I am now with my life experience, I would love to repeat that moment with him yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't do it as a 20-year-old as a 
two year old at that moment. You know, there's a very subtle thing that I want to just relive for a moment. I think it's interesting that Robert Shaw conducted an orchestra wearing a jock strap. <laughs> He's very well, physical. <laughs> he always wore one outfit for his entire career. Yeah. It was blue pants and a blue pullover, sort of heavy uh, uh, post t shirt. It was heavier than a t shirt. And during the first half of the rehearsal, he would always sweat completely through it, completely. And then he'd sometimes, just in our breaks, he'd run down and take a quick shower, uh, and then he'd completely change into new clothing. In the concerts, during intermission, he would completely sweat through his tails. He'd have to take a quick shower, and he'd have to change into a new set of tails, because he'd always come back with his hair completely back from the, the shower right after the intermission. That's how much he worked in doing his conducting. It's like athletic conducting. That's, yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. You know, Jack, I, I think this is a, a perfect time to go ahead and, and segue into your tenure with ASO. I thought for a while we might talk about the teaching first, but I think that we've kind of set this up to, to go into the to your experiences with the ASO. And so when you first joined the orchestra, you had mentioned uh, before that Atlanta Orchestra did not have the type of rep, uh, reputation that, say, like the Chicago Symphony had or Philadelphia. Now, the Atlanta Symphony, during the time that you were there, you were there for about, was it 33 years? 32 years. 30, 32 years. The reputation significantly improved, skyrocketed, shall we say, to where it's not a stretch to, to mention the Atlanta Symphony in the same breath as some of these orchestras. That's right. What happened during that time, in other words, aside from getting players, what are, what are the things that occurred that made that orchestra lift itself up to being a, a world-renowned orchestra? It's a zigzaggy road to be able to analyze that. Um, you know, the growth of an orchestra partially takes place by the support of its patrons. And that means a lot of interaction with the society of Atlanta mm -hmm. to have much more support to allow for the growth to take place. One of the ways they determined that the orchestra had to be more visible is that we had to go on the road. We had to become more visible to various parts of the United States. I know we started with many runouts and short tours, but we did, uh, we did a long tour, which was, I'm going to say, three weeks. And that was a bus tour. We, we couldn't fly places like we finally ended up doing. And we were on a Greyhound bus for like three weeks, every night playing a different place, just like you were a rock band on the road with whatever it would be at that time, 75 musicians. Some of them were quite aged, you know, and they had to get that first experience of, of touring like that. I hadn't toured like that either. Um, so we had to become visible which made it very difficult for me because I was struggling to keep my job at Georgia State alive and I was having to leave for that period of time. Uh, we, that's a whole nother talk. I don't even know that it'll come about on this interview, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I've got a whole nother life there that was as important to me at the university as the symphony was. So the growth was partially the being visible on the road. The next part of the growth was to expand our season we were only at some 30 to 32 weeks when Robert Shaw came. We were not a year-round orchestra. So the first thrust for the orchestra was to be able to increase, to reach eventually 52 weeks with four to six weeks paid vacation. You know, that's, that's a professional orchestra's level. We were being paid, I think it was for me, I, I looked up, I, I found all this out. It was approximately $130 a week. And that came to a, with other money coming in a little bit uh, from the whatever we did. It's coming to about seven thousand dollars a year. Now seven thousand dollars a year back in 1967. I was amazed to find when I did a future comparison, and I really have to do this with the school to make it appropriate. But I'll have to divide that in half. It was approximately in today's money fifty-one thousand dollars. I had no idea that in today's money that that would generate about that much. But that was a direct comparison that I did online looking up. I thought it was very low, but it was actually, I guess, fairly good money for that time. But again, that was only for 30 weeks. 
during the year. You had your entire summer off. So eventually we realized, and here's the way an orchestra works, if you didn't realize it. When an orchestra plays in a concert hall, they're losing money, mm -hmm. constantly losing money. When an orchestra goes on the road because they've pre-contracted all the arrangements, they're basically making even. Mm -hmm. When an orchestra plays their pops concerts, like playing at Chastain Park, they're making money. They're making some of the biggest money that they make throughout their season. Now, I, I'm not, I, I wasn't a person that was in the center of all the activities that took place union-wise, because you remember, the orchestra is a union orchestra, a member of the AFL-CIO, and we live by strict union rules. So we grew through negotiations in the union with our management. We grew to negotiate 30 weeks to 35 weeks, 35 weeks to 42 weeks. I remember when we were at 42 weeks. Go to 45, go to 48, incrementally over each group of a three-year contract for instrument. When you grow eventually to become a 52-week year-round orchestra, now you're becoming the essence of a Cleveland Orchestra or Chicago Symphony mm -hmm. or New York Philharmonic you're reaching that status. You're also being supported because you have subscribers coming in year round to great concerts with this fantastic addition to Shaw being one of the greatest choral conductors in the world. So we had a hundred voice or uh, orchestra, a hundred, well, you can call an orchestra a voice. We had a hundred piece, well, we didn't get to that high. We had a 90 piece orchestra and a hundred voice choir singing and recording with Telarc and other great recording people. These wonderful choral works. That was beginning to increase our patronage to phenomenal levels. And of course the patronage, am I saying that word mm -hmm. right? I think I am, would support the orchestra financially, the donors. I, my Arthur and uh, uh, Arthur Montgomery, uh, Julie Arthur and Julie Montgomery, for instance, gave whatever the um, sponsorship or donation was that my chair in the symphony was named that chair. Uh, just a small example of it. But those huge donors came in, and I'm sure it was millions and millions of dollars. I'm sure mm -hmm. it is to support the orchestra. So we grew by becoming a 52 year week season. We grew when we did our international tours. For instance, when we traveled to Europe and we played the first concert when the Berlin Wall came down. That was making us on the map. That was world renowned awareness of mm -hmm. the Atlanta Symphony. And that's a wonderful story in itself, a heart touching story. I can't probably share it on the time we have, but it's that kind of event that would bring the orchestra to national, international recognition. And there were just so many things like that. Our, uh, I did, I think, 40 plus recordings with the orchestra. That brings you to the attention of people around, uh, everywhere. They can buy the recordings. You go on the road and play the same pieces that you record, just like you would. And that brings it to national attention. So on it goes. So would it, as far as growing uh, the amount of time, it became a full-time year-round that in turn draw uh, better players, would make, the, make it more attractive? And it makes the audition requirements, uh, well, the audition requirements were just as stringent. Even if we were, even if we were growing and we were at a 40-week season, they were still looking, of course, for the highest level national prominent performers mm -hmm. that they could mm -hmm. bring in but you had to have the funding to be able to pay for them mm -hmm. for instance the concert mistress at that time might require a two hundred thousand dollar plus salary to occupy that position because mm -hmm. they could go someplace else and audition and they might be awarded that plus more and you've got to have the competitive uh, salaries to be able to support those kind of players. Section players didn't make that kind of money at all. Right. But those certain principal positions 
uh, not mine as much, but we negotiated the best we could uh, to get that kind of sponsorship. Sure. So now, Jack, let's talk about the principal position that you held. Describe to our audience your duties inside of your section. Okay. I spent 32 years going to the library and having to mark parts approximately four to six weeks ahead with the uh, of the time they would be played massive amounts of music you know we got to a point where we were playing 200 concerts a year with four pieces to six pieces on each concert and i think if you take that times 10 years it's something like 50,000 performances of course many pieces repeat themselves so i had to mark the music with the initials for my section players on every single entrance because it wasn't there. It wasn't like a violin part that had the same music for every player or every mm -hmm. other part of the instrument, every other part of the orchestra. They all had their music completely laid out for them, but not the percussion section. That's what they have to do and should do in high school and junior high and all that, but they struggle with it. So at the professional level, I had to mark and mark and mark music for hours a day, all weekends, all Sundays, all evenings, even during the, uh, well, during the concerts when I was off stage. The second thing is I had to be uh, aware of any new equipment that was needed for a particular piece. Like sometimes we might have to borrow from the Dallas Symphony a huge set of the church bells that they owned to do the Berlioz Requiem. And that was a major deal to get those on loan from another symphony. It required <laughs> like an 18 wheeler or something to get them here. And then they had to be carefully unloaded and set up. So anything that came up, the cannons for the 1812 overture started out as being a 12 gauge shotgun shot into a barrel. <laughs> and it ended up to be electronically controlled with buttons that would set off these unbelievable sounds like the National Symphony does for the uh, Washington performances. You know, we had to find out how to grow with all of that. And I had to be responsible for that growth. So it was this endless supply of new sounds and equipment coming in. So it was marking the music and it was uh, providing all the new equipment continuously. Then obviously I had to go and play all of my parts that came up. And those were the snare or the mallet parts that were the major excerpts that had to be performed over and over. I was responsible for both the snare and the major mallet excerpts. The other players did not play those. They played the secondary parts in our section. Um, those were the three primary responsibilities. I know there was more. It's not coming into my mind as clear as it should be right now, but uh, there was like three or four things that I had to do continuously. But I had to work with a stage manager uh, all the time to coordinate the setups, the, equ the equipment that we needed on a weekly basis. I had to turn in all of our equipment necessities in writing. Every single piece of equipment that I had to bring up from storage right. had to be turned in in writing to come in for us. That, was, that took a lot of time to organize that. So I was not a performer. I was about 20% a performer, I was about 80% an administrator, taking care of all the details that made the section work. And when a piece of music came up, the equipment was there, the assignments were made, and the players were all in place knowing exactly what they were supposed to do. Then I could finally relax for 15 minutes and sit down behind my instrument and concentrate on playing and performing my own part. Yeah. Now. One thing I want to talk about that, that is actually going to feed our way into another topic that we want to talk about some of your great experiences and great stories that you had with, with the orchestra. But the one thing that I want to talk about that leads into that is for anyone who's ever spent any time playing in an orchestra, I have a limited experience playing in an orchestra. All of my experiences is, is playing drum set and pops concerts right. with the Atlanta <clears throat> Symphony and so on. But one thing I think that is... Um, a prevalent uh, feeling and knowledge that a lot of people have is that a lot of times orchestras are not the most friendly work environment. Mm 
And I, I know that there are problems that go from section to section and sometimes problems inside of sections and whatnot. And I asked you right before we, we sat down, why does it seem like that orchestras have this reputation for having just intense personnel and then just sometimes a hostile work environment? And what, what is your thought on that? Well, there's no doubt that an orchestra is like a great big single family it is a family you live together you eat together you work together you perform together you negotiate together you're friends together and think what happens in any functional and i think the orchestra would probably be divided between a functional and a non-functional family it has its moments where it becomes both there can be these intense moments that take place when you're performing when we're one mind we do the most fantastic things of communicating with each other that we're all thinking exactly the same thing at the same time and the energy that's there transfers between every player and you're all thinking literally as one mind that's the magic of it when you're trying to solve personality problems between the players you have any kind of personality conflict that you would have between any two people that have opposing personalities and they have different wishes or desires that they would like for the other person to have but they don't and so there's a conflict and when those conflicts arise they escalate because you can't get away from the other person and they keep escalating to the point that sometimes it becomes violent sometimes there will be heightened emotions words exchanged perhaps even a little pushing or tugging could take place not much of that it's mostly going to the personnel manager for the orchestra and endless complaining about such and such a person did this to me or this habit of that person has to change or i have to have a new seating place a lot of times it would take place in the violin section or the cello section or not the cello probably the, the violins i guess more i think the violins are probably having to work together as a single mind more than any other section because they're playing basically the same part i just think about it if, if you're on a, a brass section or a clarinet section or, or anything you're playing your own individual part so you've got your own life to express but if you're in a violin section you've got the first and second violins all the firsts are playing the same thing. All the seconds are playing the same thing. So if somebody next to you is not doing it in a way that's conducive to the way that you're comfortable with and you're living next to them, you're having to absorb all of those personality characteristics of that person. For instance, every time they stop, that person wants to talk to you or tell you a joke and you're not of that frame of mind. And, and just take that on to the next level of that going on between 10 or 15 violins standing there with that interaction taking place all back and forth especially those that want to turn around and talk to the person behind them or tap the person and talk to them in front of them etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, i'll give you one example one of the funny quotes there was a person that was a violin player in the orchestra that loved to listen to the ball games so we were in a rehearsal of course the other violinist didn't like this he had the ball game playing in an ear piece in his ear while we were rehearsing that makes the other violinist a little nervous they don't like that but then the earpiece fell out <laughs> and you could hear the sound of the ball game going during the rehearsal so that person was an annoyance in general to the other players around him both by his habits and his demeanor and you know maybe having cigarette smoke or alcohol on his breath whatever it would be just just one example not you no know, that's that's an example now jack <clears throat> you sent uh over in a, that mailing uh a list of different 
some some funny and wonderful and and very prideful moments uh, of your time at the ASO, and then there's some that you said they were absolutely devastating moments. So right. let's cover both of those. Okay. All <laughs> right. And, and so I've got a I've got a. It short... looks like this is going to be an orchestra yeah. day, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think so. We'll have to come and, back to the university though if we could sometime. Uh, oh, abs hundred percent. We're we're going to do that. All right. Um, so I want to cover a few of these, and I've got them organized between good and terrifying <laughs> how's that all right so the first one <laughs> why don't you tell us about there was an issue during uh, a pops concert with henry mancini that was a failed chimes entrance <laughs> this was my worst moment in my entire career in the atlanta symphony i believe even as i reflect back on it <clears throat> Worse than the triangle in the Wagner. Worse than the triangle. Yeah. Give me just a second. For sure. <laughs> because don't worry, we're, we're going we're gonna to come up with some great ones uh, after this. <clears throat> Henry Mancini was conducting a Pops concert in Chastain Park. Cecil Welch, by the way, I think was working with him as the lead trumpet because he became the lead trumpet with, C uh, with Henry on mm -hmm. the road. He became his lead trumpet player, great trumpet player. So <clears throat> Henry Mancini, the well-known pops arranger and conductor, was conducting his own music. One of the pieces we played was uh, Hong Kong Fireworks. That required the xylophone player to just play this unbelievably fast series of runs on the xylophone. I played chromatic scales from the bottom of the instrument to the top of the instrument as fast as I could go. It'd be like playing 16th notes at 2.08 on the metronome for about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I had the other percussionist, Gene Ream, count for me out loud because I couldn't possibly keep where we were in the music and then like slap me on the shoulder and show me exactly where we were in the music by pointing so I could get back in the music to be able to replay. We did that kind of things through our entire career to help each other out. Uh, that was, you had to. That was one piece. And then we went to uh, P uh, Peter Gunn and that required me to go over to the conga. And I had to play the Peter Gunn on the conga, which is a big, loud, kind of half-featured point. And I didn't play a lot of conga. I had my one basic beat down. And I played that till my hands were just burning because I tried to play it as loud as I possibly could. I had the xylophone. I had the conga. <clears throat> and now we come to this little piece that was the <clears throat> Wrigley's commercial, which is the Juicy Fruit. Isn't that right? The, uh, the Juicy Fruit commercial piece. Was it the one with the twins? Double your pleasure. Yeah, double your pleasure. Right. Your double, mint gum. double mint gum. Double, double, double mint, mint gum. gum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. The chimes had the melody for that. Now, this is a Pops concert, so I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. You, usually, you had one or two rehearsals. And, of course, think about all the logistics we talk about. The equipment, the music being marked organizing the section, and then trying to learn my part for the Pops concert. I hadn't worked on the chimes part as much as I should, but I had the spotlight coming down pretty much in my eye, and I was looking at the music, trying to glance back and forth like you have to, to play the chimes when you don't have a piece of music memorized. Now, believe it or not, and all the time I had played in the symphony, that was probably one of the more difficult things I had to do was play a full melody on the chimes that I didn't have memorized. So I started playing, and I got about halfway through the tune. Miked, microphone, thousands of people in the Chastain audience. And I just had a blip. I had a blank out. I couldn't find my place in the music. I couldn't play it from memory. So the tune just stopped right in the center. In addition to all the sweat that was running down me from being out in Chastain Park in 90 degree heat, this cold flush of blood just came circulating down through my body and I sat down and I was crushed. I just sat down, I just stared at the floor. And I just kept staring at the floor until the piece had ended and the audience had clapped. What I didn't realize is that when you were supposed to take your bow, Mancini was pointing to me from the podium to take my bow. And I wasn't even looking up then. And the string players all of a sudden started yelling, or not yelling at me, but they started motioning to me and they saying, Jack, Jack, he wants you to take a bow. And right then, Mancini had come off of his podium 
and he was coming charging through the orchestra <laughs> and he was swearing every obscene comment that you could think of if he was born a sailor <laughs> at me to take my fill it in bow so with him standing there pointing at me red-faced i stood up cameras microphones spotlight i took my bow he left and i sat back down i think that was the worst moment i ever had in the orchestra well now let's back that up with a really cool very fine moment and this one actually comes well i've always said that that some of my favorite comments that i get are from from fellow comrades fellow musicians it's always great getting things from the audience but you got an incredibly nice comment and it's and it's surrounded it's, it's a little bit of a funny situation also but there's a story that happened in the orchestra you were playing uh the orchestra was playing uh bartok music for string instruments oh, percussion yes, and mm-hmm. celeste mm-hmm. and for the people who are not familiar with this i think it's the second movement in it jack that starts out with this uh accelerando on uh xylophone that jack was playing and then right after that then timpani comes in tell us what happened when you uh started that second movement well it was just a rehearsal with robert shaw it was just a tender moment, just a wonderful tender moment. You won't kind of forget in your life when you're in the orchestra because Paul and I had just a wonderfully close friendship. And if you missed it earlier, if it didn't register with you, Paul Jancic, the timpanist with the Atlanta Symphony during my earlier years, is now the timpanist with the Cleveland Orchestra. He was on the behind the, the timpani listening to me play this moving forward, accelerating note, single note, on the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Or music no, no, for no, string no, 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 music for percussion. strings. Yeah. Uh, say it again. Music for string instruments, percussion, and celeste. There you are. Thank you. You're a master musician. I, I, <laughs> well. I appreciate that. <laughs> He's just got a good memory. Good memory. <laughs> <laughs> they that's, go that's, together, you know. Yeah, that's, I know. That's, that's, one but, of my but, favorite pieces. But still. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got that straight. <laughs> now, I, I just simply finished it, and the timpani was supposed to come in uh, right after, but Paul didn't come in. So, of course, Mr. Shaw stopped the orchestra, and he just looked at Paul about the entrance. No big deal. And Paul just said in a loving way, he said, Jack just played that entrance so wonderfully, I just forgot to come in. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's, that's, that's tremendous. High praise. (laughs) Nice. Likewise, there's another there's another funny section story that I read in in one of the transcripts that you sent me. Also, tell us just briefly about uh, one of your section percussionists, Eugene Ream, yes. who chiefly you and I discussed before. He was primarily your cymbals cymbal yes, player. Yes, he was right? a cymbal expert. What happened in Tchaikovsky uh, Fourth? That's a little confusing. Now, uh, it might have confused you on the bullet list. Okay, but yeah. that is a, a, a wonderful story if you'd like for me to tell it a very funny story with sure. robert shaw and a yeah. symbol player I, I think the bullet list got out of sync there. okay i meant to tell you that when we were meeting earlier but I'll go tell ahead you now. go ahead all right we were on an an era of the experimentation for the symphony which did not work well where we decided that we would combine the atlanta symphony players with various not community but other cities orchestras so we would go out and we would spend a residency where we would perform with another orchestra that means that we would take our orchestra and divide it into two parts one orchestra would go to one city the other half of the orchestra would go to another city and we would combine our players with the resident players of that city so i was combined with the percussion section of that particular city and we were doing the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony. We were in a performance and when you come to the fourth movement of the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony there's a big bass drum and crash cymbal part. Very exciting. I was playing timpani at that time. Cymbal player was a very nice fellow but he wasn't one of those very unique advanced musicians. So when the part came up, he did his first few cymbal crashes. Now that part requires a fairly fast page change 
to get to the next entrance. He reached out and turned the page, and he had the symbols uh, cupped under his arm while he reached out to make the page change. But when he made the page change, the music started to fall, and he only had a few seconds. So he grabbed the music, and he put it in his teeth. <laughs> Heaven knows why. So he had the music in his teeth. He picked up his second symbol from under his arm, and he tried to make the crash in time. I think he knew intuitively where it was going to come. But instead of making this fantastic, wonderful crash that the end of the Tchaikovsky Symphony requires, he crashed the two cymbals directly on his music. <laughs> and you heard this whoop kind of sound taking place as he crushed his music instead of hitting the cymbals. And while Robert Shaw was conducting, he looked over at the cymbal player and dropped these half glasses down that he wears so that he could look over at the cymbal player on the top of his glasses, and then he pushed them up and looked away and kept conducting, and that was that moment. <laughs> A nice airlock <laughs> for the for yeah, cymbal yeah, crash. Right. Fantastic. So now, Jack, in the latter portion of your career with ASO, um, a new music director came in my worst 10 years yeah and and we we won't we won't beat you up on this too much but just tell the folks a little bit about your last 10 years or so with yoel levy when he came into the orchestra his his reputation in many different ways good and bad preceded himself when he got there he was fabulous musician he's a guy that never conducted with a score um think he, about that yeah oh i think, know think about a, a, a Mahler symphony sure uh, score that's three inches thick being mm -hmm. conducted from memory think of him looking at a piece of music that was brought to him while he was on the podium for a quick commercial and he opens it up and he reads through it and then he hands the music back to the person that gave it to him and then he plays it from conducts it from memory yeah so n no doubt that his qualifications are beyond reproach he's definitely a fantastic musician but um, tell the listening audience about some of the issues that you had with him everything from what we'll call it sometimes a lack of communication or a lack of wanting to communicate also with just some of the demands that he put on you <clears throat> I think the best way to answer that is to give a profound example sure we were at Carnegie Hall we played I played Carnegie seven times over my career the orchestra's played a number more times since I retired that's an unusual place because the labor requirements the union requirements mean that you're not able to touch your own equipment as the union team brings your equipment on and places it in the area that you're to perform and then you're able to go ahead and set it up and adjust it well as an example we had a fair amount of equipment <clears throat> not a ton of it but a good amount when Robert Shaw was conducting he would be at the stage oh, at least an hour before and he'd be right there to answer any questions that you had about your setup. Mr. Shaw, what do you think about this setup? Do you want us to move anything to make it more convenient for the performance? Well, I think it should be. Then he'd have you move it over where it should be. Mr. Levy showed up about 15 minutes before the performance started. And just in his own tone of voice, with that particular accent, he said, I want the percussion equipment to be on the other side of the stage. All of it. <laughs> Fifteen minutes before the performance started. Well, I can't tell you. And that's, that's an example of the way things were. I can't tell you what kind of emotional trauma that I went through on the stage of Carnegie with the audience there trying to move like a, a bird in flight, all of us, to get our equipment changed to the other side of the stage before the downbeat. I was just emotionally shaking. My hands were shaking. I think all I had to do was play a triangle or something. I think I touched the triangle against a music stand, making a sound uh, before it started. He looked over and glared at me very quickly. Well, that's an example of it. You know, it kind of goes back also to one of the topics that we covered earlier uh, was 
it seems to me that there are times that orchestras are intentionally antagonistic. I, it's just, it's unfathomable to me that a leader of an orchestra would intentionally do that type of thing when he knows he has to have sometimes upward of a hundred people on the same page. Well, let's draw a comparison here. <clears throat> when Mr. Levy came into the orchestra, he came into an orchestra that had been with Robert Shaw for 21 plus years. There were those in the orchestra that were absolutely in love with Robert Shaw and his choral productions. There were those in the orchestra that truly felt Robert Shaw should have never been the conductor for the Atlanta Symphony because he had a choral background. He didn't have an orchestral background. And there is a difference between conducting a choir and conducting an orchestra. So when he began producing these wonderful large choral concerts, we became a great orchestra, but he didn't have to conduct us. We just played and he conducted the choirs in essence. When Yoel Levy came in, he was a true orchestral conductor, but he also auditioned and brought in those that were his chosen people, the ones that he was the most favorable towards. And they were in the cello section or the violin section or the first trumpet player, and on you go. Just name the replacements that took place that would be the very players that he wanted to be in the orchestra, not the ones that were there. They were let go? This is a very unusual situation. You cannot let a player just go. Mm -hmm. If they're there for a period of time, they in essence have tenure. I'm thinking of a particular situation. I won't name it. You can reduce a player to another position in the orchestra, like take a player off of a principal position. You can, in essence, semi-retire a player and pay them to, in essence, stay at home and bring them in from time to time on a children's concert or on a run out or on some secondary position. It's very, very difficult to fire someone in the orchestra. You can take that person and say, you need to improve. I'm not satisfied with your playing. I want you to go take private lessons from this famous teacher to improve your technique. For instance, in Paul's first couple of years in the orchestra, he couldn't play a timpani role as loud, and he didn't, as loud as Shaw required. So we laughed, but he had to go up and take loud lessons <laughs> from Cloyd Duff, and he mastered it. But when you're in the orchestra now, I'll give another example. If you are belligerent, or if you confront the conductor, or if you say something directly to the conductor in a rehearsal that is totally antagonistic, you can be fired on the spot. You cannot do that. Now think about all the tension that that creates when you're under that kind of a performance situation. Mm -hmm. That happened actually to one player in the orchestra that did a quick response back to Robert Shaw, and they were fired. And it did go to court, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a very unusual situation. I, I shouldn't go into that. Now, Difficult, I gotta say especially one with a, a, you know, a personality that could be... Oh, the personalities but, in the yeah. orchestra sometimes were so profoundly strong mm -hmm. that to have them self-contain was... Power the conductor has in that red-faced almost. Mm -hmm. I had one situation there that almost broke me. We were doing a performance where we needed uh, a larger slapstick. The other players didn't happen to own a slapstick as large as the one that I had in my case. I should have provided it for them, but I was just being myself at that moment, part of myself. And it came up the need for it. So he asked, uh, Levy asked, and I was supposed to go off and get the slapstick right away. And I did. I got out of my section. I started walking across the stage to get my slapstick. In essence, I knew better than that. I should have run. But he stood on the podium in front of everybody, and he mimicked an old man walking back and forth on the 
on the podium. And I stopped in the middle of the stage and I looked over at him and I just stared at him with anger on my face. But in my head, it said, don't get fired. Oh yeah. Don't get fired. So I went out to where my case was out there and I just threw the equipment out of my case onto the floor. Everybody out there could hear my, my accessory instruments slamming out halfway across the backstage area. And then I, and I, I did run basically from there. I walked fast. And then I came back quickly with my slapstick after I had made the slight uh, you know, reaction to that that I could off stage to let it be known. And then I went back to assume my position behind the chimes, I think. But there's just another example. Mm. So, Jack, after 32-plus super successful years yes, they with were. this orchestra, they were. Um, which saw not only, of course, your career hit new heights, but also just the orchestra itself turn into a world-class performing Absolutely. Uh, ensemble, you decided to retire. And quite honestly, did did the music director, Levy, did, did he factor into that? Yes, absolutely. But we almost have to go into the second story of my entire life to be able to justify all the elements that went into this coming about. Mm -hmm. Because you know, from what you've read, that I was holding four jobs right. for my 32 years, but my 30 years. I was principal percussionist with the Atlanta Symphony. I was associate professor of music at Georgia State University, and I was running a full-time program down there. I had 20 private students every day of the week, Monday through Friday for 30 years. And I was a recording studio musician and played all kinds of extra gigs and taught the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra. And I started a steel band and I uh, did the Atlanta Percussion Trio and on and on it goes. And there's stories about each of those for that period of time. When I reached age 55, working all of that and we would have to talk another time about how i made the major transition in my life come about it is a very financially interesting story as to how a musician might be able to do that mm -hmm. i was emotionally and physically worn out i could keep the jobs going when i was there but i was breaking down my hands started shaking when i was playing scheherazade I couldn't control a quiet roll the way I used to. I thought about trying to take some kind of medication for it. There, there's a funny joke in the orchestra about a, a second violist who was taking medication, you know, mm -hmm. to just be able to, to play. I mean, right. that's the most, uh, I want a good word, but it was the most hidden place in the orchestra that you could possibly right. be. But anyway, yeah. uh, so anyway, I didn't do that. Um, I'm losing my thought thing a little bit, but I, I, I just couldn't keep going with the career. Now, that's a whole story in itself, but uh, what was your original question? Let me get it exactly the, right. The decision to retire. Yes. Was a, that and, was the, and, if, and if Levy held a lot of influence in that. He, he was not the deciding factor at all. He was just part of the puzzle that had to be put together to say, why are all these pieces floating around in the air causing me to be exhausted? depressed, debilitated in my performance, emotionally not being able to go on. I had to put each little piece of the puzzle on the back of the map. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that uh, uh, little by little, it wasn't just Levy, he was another little larger piece of the, of the puzzle, but an emotional um, attack to who I was every time I went in for the rehearsal. Not every time, of course, but you know, to, to make a point. And right. so when you put all that together, sitting with my wife, my loving wife, at the table, we very slowly, because this is not an overnight decision, and through asking and talking to many people, professionally and uh, friends and otherwise, I began to make the decision as to how I would begin to let things go. And I couldn't let anything go. Uh, it was who I was. I was totally wrapped up in all of that, and that's uh, it's all I knew. Uh, was to be all that I had become, not who I was to become. 
Mm -hmm. Jack, I think this is a great place to take a little break. All right. I hope we can continue as we said we might. There's, oh, we will. There's no doubt. There's no doubt we're going to continue. But thanks for sharing with us what is essentially your musical upbringing in your own education and into your actual ASO performance career. And we will be back shortly. Let, let me say, uh, yeah. you, you should say the last word, but let me say my final word. Sure. Go right ahead. At this moment for my career and all my wonderful students at Georgia State, and all that's happened in Atlanta, I will just put a single statement out that the song is over, but the melody is lingering on. Well, there is part one of our interview with Jack Bell. Uh, before I forget, I want to direct everyone over to Jack's personal website. It is www.melodiousmerchant.com melodiousmerchant.com um, On that site, there is extensive information about Jack's uh, life, his bio, his performance career, his educational career. And more importantly, I want everyone to check out some of the different links that are on there of Jack's playing. There are some just amazing snare drum videos. There are some older uh, mallet audio clips of him back when he was just a kid playing some incredible stuff uh, on marimba. So make sure you go by MelodiousMerchant.com and check out some more information about Jack Bell. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, join us back here for part two. And this is going to be basically a lesson for everyone. Jack Bell is going to go through his tenure as uh, coordinator of the percussion department at Georgia State. He's going to talk about some of his legendary students, and Sonny Emery is included in that. For you, for you who remember Sonny's interview here on the show, Sonny talked very highly about Jack and his time that he spent at Georgia State and the lessons that he had with Jack Bell. Well, Jack's going to turn it around and tell some great stuff about Sonny. And then we are going to go through some of the different methods that Jack is very, very familiar with included is the Wilcoxon uh, 150, ru 150 uh, rudimental solos and then the swing solos book. He's going to give us some very, very in-depth information about some misinterpretations that are commonly done and how to interpret some of these different notations and different things in those books correctly. Don't forget, new shows come out every single Monday. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, and anywhere you download or stream your favorite podcasts. All right. Until next week, on behalf of John and Jack, this is Phil, and we'll see you then. <laughs>